Welcome to Quilting's first reality show, live and unscripted with Susan Smith. Did you love that one? Warm thanks to our son, Will, who does these cute little intros for me. It does make it a little more interesting, doesn't it? Anyway, welcome, welcome. I am Susan Smith. You're in my studio, Stitched by Susan. And today, we are working on a project that's kind of a crossover between edge to edge and custom. Um, it's not custom in the sense that there's no ruler work. There's not really any pre-marking or things like that. But I am using the piecing as a guideline for my quilting. Um, you'll see. It's a clamshell quilt, so you'll see how that works in just a few moments. So I think without further ado, we'll... Um, yeah, I'm just thinking. My head's got a lot of... Okay, got it. I'm just trying to get my, my stuff in order here. Before I start actually loading, I do want to tell you about a couple more things. Today's topics, to begin with, are going to be the quilt itself, but in particular talking about thread choices for a quilt that has multi-colors on it, a lot of different colors, and how I go about choosing thread for that, and then also my rationale for loading in a certain direction. Um, so I'll talk that through as I'm doing it. And that's kind of my style with these live and unscripted episodes is that they're not a class per se, but I just talk through the particular quilt that I'm working on and the decisions that are made surrounding it and my whys. And I hope that really helps those of you who maybe aren't as confident in your quilting to see that behind the scenes thought process so that you can take some of those whys and when you're at your next project that has some choices or decisions, you can maybe find it easier to make those decisions by thinking through in a similar way. This is interactive because we're live, so feel free to type in questions at any time, and I'll answer them at I, as I work or maybe at the end of each pass. These episodes are always aired on the first and the third Friday of each month. So that's when they're live. They, of course, remain on YouTube all the time. But if you want to come in live and ask the questions, first and third Friday of every month, 9 a.m. Pacific time. A couple other things you might be interested in. Um, I also have a podcast and it's called Measure Twice, Cut Once, in which I interview other crafters and mostly quilters. Some of them are people for whom quilting is a business. Many are people for whom they just have a story of the impact that some type of craft has had in their life and they tell their story. So they're conversations. You can listen to past episodes very easily at podcast.stitchedbysusan.com. There have been some great ones in the past and some good ones coming up over the next few weeks as well. So I'd love for you to listen and to share with your friends who you think might enjoy the same types of encouraging stories. Also, if you are interested in supporting this show, there's a super easy way to do it. You know I love my coffee, right? So buymeacoffee.com forward slash stitched by Susan. And there for as little as $5, the price of one coffee or so, you are able to contribute and support this show. Now you can either do a one-time contribution or if you choose, you can actually sign up for a monthly membership amount of your choosing. So if you care to. And some of the things that we do with that money are like, it's always earmarked for improving our presentations. So I have a camera, for example, on Lucy the long arm, the one that does all the close-ups close -ups of the quilting is a GoPro camera. And we purchased that because it it's designed to deal with movement and motion and vibration. So that works well on the camera, giving you a better view as I'm stitching. So far in the rest of the room, we do all our recording on iPhones. So kind of next in our list of upgrades is to actually acquire some real legitimate <laughs> business person cameras, the real thing, you know. So for one thing, they would be wireless because I've got a little bit of a spaghetti mess of wires. So these are just kind of the things that we're trying to do. And that's where the buy, buy me a coffee funds always go is just to improving um, the level of show that we can produce and or making it easier and with less hiccups in it. So I do thank you. Many of you have supported me frequently and many of you have become members and do it monthly. And I really, really appreciate that. It means a lot to me. Um, what else? Like and subscribe by all means. If you enjoy this episode, if you've enjoyed past ones, I would love for you to click on the thumbs up below the video. And I would really love if you would share this with other quilters who would benefit from the same kind of um, uh, reality show, if you will, of quilting. So you're, it's unedited completely. So you get to see when I have tension trouble or thread breaks or those things happen. They're part of the show. And it's just kind of like getting to be a fly on the wall in my studio and see how things go down. So again, first and third Friday of every month. Live and unscripted, same time, same place. Okay, I think I've got... 
all my little bits off my menu there. I've got a little show flow, we call it, of things that I need to talk about, right? So last but not least, let me introduce Lucy in case you haven't met her. Uh, this is my long arm. It's a gamel. You can see the word big and bold. It's a gamel elevate, which means I actually do have a digitized system. Um, I don't use it very often because freehand quilting is what I have learned that I absolutely love to do. But Lucy is a workhorse. She drives like a Cadillac. She has a 26 inch throat. So I have lots of room to do my edge to edge work. I love this machine. Well, I love Lucy. Let's just be honest. And you guys can't see on camera, but one of my friends gave me an I love Lucy sign, which is super cute and hangs above Lucy all the time. So that's Lucy. Um, I've got Lucy preloaded with thread, but we are going to have a talk about the thread choice as we go. But first, let's get started loading and let's talk about directionality. So I think we should look at the quilt first. Bear with me while I grab it. Here's the little quilt. Wow, the colors are bright on camera. It's very gorgeous. It's these rich um, lavenders and mauves and deep magentas. Just beautiful. So you can see it's all clamshells. They are not appliqued. They are pieced. So the seam allowances are, are typical quilt seam allowances. They're not particularly bulky, but obviously it's directional. I want the, the curve of the clamshell to be at the top of the quilt when it's finished, right? So laying that aside, here's my backing. And here you get to see it from the right side. Can you see that it's all little sheep? Turn it a bit so you can see it in various ways. So it's important to me that my sheep go up and that my clamshells go up. Now from there, my first choice of a way to load a quilt when it's longer one way than the other is to actually load it sideways because then when I'm advancing it on the rails, there's fewer advances. It's more efficient with my time, less advances and basting and things like that. However, in the case of this quilt, the clamshells are all in a row and I intend to quilt them in a row. So I want to load my quilt right side up so that I can make my way back and forth on the rows. So that's why I'm loading this way today because I want my quilt top that way. Therefore, my quilt backing is oriented exactly the same way. So it's really wise to think that through. Um, I will often ask my clients when they bring their quilts in to put something simple marking tops and you might do this for yourself because it's all too easy, especially if you're just doing one quilt after another to get one of them turned 90 or 180 degrees and that is disaster. So check, do whatever you need to, but watch for that directionality. And lastly, the backing does have a seam. I doubt that you can see it because it's a pretty busy print. It's right here and it happens to be running horizontally when I'm loading my, my backing this way. I'm not stuck on having my backing seam horizontal. Sometimes it ends up vertical. These are just all the different things that I consider and weigh, you know, is it worth loading it sideways if my seam ends up being vertical? If the seam's not flat, you know, that might influence my decision too. These are just all the things I think about, but this one is great. Let me just grab my little red snappers and apparently there's a question. And Dave, would you grab me that spool of thread that's sitting right there as well, please? Okay. Let's take the question. Betsy, is there an easy way of making sure that the horizontal backing seam is centered in the quilt top? Um, I covered that in another episode, Betsy, and I, I do it in a sort of low tech way, which is I fold my backing in half or lay it out on the floor fully if it's big enough, but I usually do it in half, fold my backing in half and fold my top in half. And I mark with a pin uh, where the quilt top should be on the backing. Does that make sense? So I orient them the way I want them to be when it's finished. And I put a very visible pin through the backing. So then when I load the backing, I can see that pin and I can line up the top of the quilt with it. So that's pretty accurate to within like a half an inch. If you need more accuracy than that, I'm probably not your lady. Okay, red snapper system, which I love. There is a simple little rod of this same red material inside the hem of my leader. And so it's super easy to load my quilt backs. All I need is a straight edge on this front, a nice straight edge. And that's what I've got. It's a cut edge. It's not a salvage. So I'm being careful not to stretch it. And the way I'm doing that is just 
when I'm holding the fabric, I'm making sure that I'm not pulling. I'm making sure that there are no wrinkles. It is just pulled enough to be smooth. And on it goes. just a little more at the end. I have a few tiny pieces. We'll tuck that on. Okay. Next step is to toss all the backing over the far rail. We gamel owners call it a take-up rail. I'm not sure what all you guys, you know, different brands are a bit different, right, in how their rails are positioned and even what names they're called. But for my purposes, I call it the take-up rail because that's where my quilt is going to roll up onto as it's being quilted. So now I come around to the back side of my quilt. And this is essential for, for my way of loading. You notice that I did not center the backing or the front with a pin. I didn't find the center of it. All that was important was getting a straight edge loaded on the front and then pulling my entire backing straight over. I don't want it pulled to one side or the other, I want it pulled straight over and pretty even tension on it. And if my backing was bigger, I would still let that hang down to the floor, but again, making sure that it's smooth and straight. Then, it's just as simple as rolling it up. And it pulls beautifully straight onto the rollers, and that little bit of friction of being pulled over the canvas leader keeps it taut and smooth, and it is easy peasy. And then I just watch until the end of it is approaching the end of my leader. And then I'll walk around and attach this end. And sorry if I'm puffing. It takes a wee bit of oomph to push these on. It's actually a question I get asked a lot is how much strength do they take? And the answer is they do take some, the red snapper system. Um, I think if I was having trouble with them, you could maybe warm them with a blow dryer or over a register in the floor and they might soften up and be easier. But it does take a wee bit of strength. For me, that's not a problem. And so I love, love, love the speed of loading. Next, I have my batting, and this is Hobbs 8020. So the 80 is cotton, the 20 is poly. It's a medium loft batting. It's very washable, it's quite durable. It has a nice drape. It doesn't uh, remember the creases. You know, it, it smooths out nicely even after it's been folded, I think. And it's really easy to work with. And it does not have a right and a wrong side, in my opinion. So it doesn't really matter which side is up or down. And here's our little quilt. Okay, there's apparently a loading question. Let's take that one and then I'll start talking about thread. All right, Charlene, I was taught to center everything on the frame. I suspect one advantage to not centering, I lost the comment. Um, is less stretching of the leaders in the same location. What influences your design not to center? First and strongest influence, uh, Charlene, for my reason not to center is speed and efficiency of loading. I do a lot of edge to edge work. I sometimes do a couple of quilts in a day. And so the difference between it taking me six or eight minutes to load as opposed to 20 or 25 minutes to load is quite a bit, you know, over a month. So that's my first reason. Um, I have never had my leaders particularly stretch out, but that does make sense to me that you would get less, you know, if you were always loading them in exactly the same spot that that center would start to stretch because they are fabric and woven too. So, but my reason chiefly is efficiency. And I find that I get really good results in terms of straightness. You know, those edges, it rolls on straight, it rolls on smooth. I spend very little time rolling back and forth or adjusting. It works pretty well and it also honestly saves time the backing does not have to be squared up so if you've got a really huge quilt it can be really difficult to square up a backing and I don't actually have to I make that front straight one straight edge 
and the rest just gets rolled on. And if there's any excess, it just gets left off after the leader. So super, super efficient. Okay, is that the question? All right, let's talk thread for a sec. Obviously in this quilt, there are lots of colors. We've got the golden color, which I'm not likely to pick because there aren't very many of them. And then there's the pink, the magenta, the lavender, the deeper purple, um, the pink and purple tones like this that are mixed. So it's all in those tones. So there's a lot of ways I could go for sure. Um, my kind of philosophy is to go middle of the road. So in other words, I'm not going to pick the very lightest lavender, which you can't quite see there under the roller. Let's shift it. Can you see this one? Yes, you can. This is the lightest one in the quilt, light lavender. Obviously there is the yellow, but I've already kind of ruled that out because that would, um, there's so little yellow actually in the quilt. So yellow is ruled out. So then my choices are pale lavender or deeper into the royal blues or into the purples or pinks. And honestly, many of those would work. But what I chose is this middle of the road, um, kind of iris color, honestly. It's definitely not a deep purple and it's definitely darker than lavender and has pink tones in it. And I think that it plays well across all of them. There's only a very few um, clamshells that are in fact exactly this color. Most are a little different, a little more blue, a little more pink. So this, I feel like, blends nicely across all of them. And that's kind of my thread philosophy is that it's not totally disappearing in some areas and totally contrasted in others that I have something that shows up pretty evenly across all the colors. So that's why I chose this one. And you saw the backing. It has the purpley bluey tones in it as well. So I'm doing exactly the same thread in the bobbin. And the brand is Isocord. It's 100% polyester. And gosh, if I could find my glasses, I could tell you the number. Isocord does not name their threads, or at least the name is not on the spool, but it's 2830. It's a really pretty color. Um, what else can I tell you? It is a 40 weight thread. I will say that. It's just a very um, middle of the road thread in terms of weight. What I love about polyester thread is that it's extremely low lint and that is ideal for a long arm machine. And also it's quite strong so it works well for um, high speed stitching. And I realized my bobbin is still sitting on my bobbin holder so I have to walk out and get that. I could hear that as soon as I went to draw up my loop. So here's my bobbin all preloaded with the same, um, same thread exactly as I have on the top. And now I'm simply going to baste my quilt on three sides. So I'm going to go up the left, across the top, down the right. You might see different quilters doing this in different orders too. They have their reasons. For sure they do. That is still not stitching quite right. So I'm going to stop talking for a sec while I try and figure this out. So I'm just pulling the bobbin out and reloading it. I start with the simplest, easiest ways. But when I know the stitch isn't forming quite right, I can hear it a little bit um, in the way that loop is being formed. And as soon as I hear that it's not quite right, then that's the time to stop and take stock. Much better. That's the kind of thing you just learn by using your machine a lot. You know, how the thread feeds through the into the needle. You know, if that changes, if there's any wobbles, if you hear a funny noise like I just did, all those things kind of are on high alert and you know your machine and the sounds it makes. I'm fortunate enough to have channel locks on my machine. They're magnetic. So now I've got my machine locked and it can't move left to right. So that way I can make this basting stitch up the side and know that it's perfectly straight. And I can actually adjust my quilt to come into line with the stitching. If you do not have a channel lock, you might have to spend a little more time um, pinning this in place straight but I use those channel locks to my advantage. And same thing across the top, I'm now putting my horizontal lock on, and so it's going to make a perfectly horizontal line. And I will adjust the quilt if need be to stay even with that stitched line. Okay, I got a little bobble there, folks. That does matter to me. Someone is asking if this is hand pieced. It is not. It is machine pieced. I should show you the back of it before I get it all attached down so you could see it. It's well done. And I could see, by the way, what I'm undoing. I could see that there was a little bit of um, fullness across the top of the quilt and I didn't quite 
react quickly enough to pull that in and I ended up with a little wee pleat and crookedness here and it's only two inches back. There's a lot of things I don't undo, but this is an easy one to fix and so I do want to do that. It will just take me a minute back up a couple inches and before I start stitching I will flip the quilt up and show you. I will, no, I'll move the close-up camera, hun. There we go. Can you guys see that? That's the piecing. So it's beautifully done. She's done it with a very uh, short stitch, and I'm sure that helped to manipulate those curves. And it is all machine pieced. So that's what it looks like. Back to my basting. You certainly could baste this with a much larger basting stitch. I choose to not spend the time adjusting that. I just use the same stitch length as I'm going to use in my quilt, which happens to be 13. So now what I'm doing to manipulate this fabric is I'm putting some tension on the area that I've already stitched, and that pulls the area yet to be stitched under my needle just a little bit faster, enough to take up this tiny bit of stretch that's going on on the top. And that, by the way, is so common. I don't know if you ever get a quilt that's perfectly, perfectly flat and square. So I'm always trying to be aware and taking up these little bits of um, variations of um, inaccuracies is not the right word, but variations, just so that it will lay flat and smooth when it's finished. It's really easy to do it if you do it in little bits as you go. And you saw that example with the pleat that I that I caught that's because I didn't take care of it soon enough I feel like achieving a flat and square quilt is very cumulative and it starts of course way back at you know cutting accurately and piecing accurately and pressing and all those things and I have no control over those things on customer quilts but when it comes to me it is still, there's some accumulation left. I can still make little adjustments and little tweaks here and there that help it to be more flat and smooth. And if I didn't do them, I would have a less great result. So I always try to be aware as I'm stitching. Okay, couple more things. Let me move Lucy out of the way. Sure, an overhead camera would be great. So here we are, up the side, Across the top, down the side are all basted in place. None of that can shift. So the last couple things I do to secure is my magnetic bars. And here they are. They're just hardware store variety, um, the type that you would hang tools on in a shop. And of course, my rails are metal. And so I can put these right on the front and that will secure this front side of the quilt. So nothing can shift as I'm working. And I have both 12 and 18 inch bars. I just use whatever works to cover that front of the quilt. And then lastly, I'll put stretchers on the side. These two are the Red Snapper brand. I very much like them because they're so long. So now I get quite even tension on my whole quilt. And I really, really like that. And then I attach my clamp and I just put enough tension on it to hold the quilt smooth and straight. There's no pulling of drum tightness on there. It's just enough to hold the quilt smooth. And at this point, my quilt is all secure and I am ready to quilt. So any more comments or questions while I take a sip and then we'll get going? All right. Charlene, in previous videos, I have not noticed you checking tension at the beginning of live quilting. Could you address checking tension? Oh man, that's a tricky one, Charlene, a little bit. Because some quilters will say, check your, you know, your bobbin tension with a TOA gauge with absolutely every bobbin. Some will say, run a few stitches with every new bobbin and check your tension. Those are all valid points and valid things to do. For myself, I've quilted a lot of quilts and I was talking earlier too about knowing exactly what my thread looks like when it's feeding through the needle or up from the bobbin and I'm pretty attuned to be able to tell when that's not quite right and go back and adjust it. If you're finding that you're ending up 
with poor tension and you're not aware of it happening and it's catching you by surprise, then you will want to step back and do some of those extra things. And one way would be, can we move Lucy enough to see? You can see how I've got a little extra batting and backing over here. You could put a scrap of fabric down there and do some stitching on that, do a few loops and do a few points and you'll soon know if there's any stitching trouble. I don't usually take the time to do that because I'm pretty confident that I'm aware of my tension and that it's good. But that's a good point because you might want to take the time to do that. Viewers might want to. That's it. Oh, okay. All right. Today's design is going to be a kind of stylized feather and each feather is going to fit within a clamshell. So I'm going to use the clamshells as my uh, quilting guide, but no marking will be needed. One other thing I'm going to do is quilt the whole clamshells. You can see a whole one here and then there's partial ones above. I'm going to leave the partials till later because as I get more familiar with the design, it'll become more clear to me what a partial one would look like. Does that make sense? So that I can make them look like they just travel off the edge of the quilt. Do I need my, I don't think I need my yardsticks. I have enough clearance. So let's just do it. This is what it's going to look like. And my goal is for my feather to pretty much fill up the clamshell so that that clamshell shape is really accentuated and visible. And I'm going to pause for just a second and lower my take up rail. Um, I don't know that you guys can see it, but my whole fabric is bouncing as I'm stitching. And that's because my, my take up bar here is elevated a little bit. There's quite a bit of clearance between my bar and the arm of my, of Lucy. So I'm going to lower that a bit. And this is something on my machine that I do frequently because the red snappers create a ridge at different times when I'm rolling, I have to go up and down with that bar and I'm fine with that. It just takes a second. But now that my quilt is down more firmly, you'll see much less of that bouncing. And I'm doing a kind of combination of the long arm feather, which is one like that, that's just a whole complete feather. And then this, which is going to be a bump back pair. And then the fourth one, which is sort of the first half of a bump back pair and then a little curlicue on my way out. And I worked out this design beforehand so that I knew what thread path I was going to follow. And I actually tried out several designs and then I conferred with the owner of the quilt, and this is the one she chose. But in particular, I was after a design that I could quilt from one side of the quilt to the other without stopping and without having to do much backtracking. Also without having to use a ruler on these clamshells, right? And that's kind of what I meant when I said this is a bit of a hybrid. It's going to look, I think, um, a bit like custom because you're going to see the shapes of the individual clamshells, but I'm not taking the time, for example, to take a ruler and actually stitch in the ditch of those clamshells. That would really elevate the time required. So I thought you all might enjoy this and see an example of a way that you can kind of simplify a quilting design and still get a pretty spectacular result. Now I do have half clams on the side, so I've kind of got to, a couple thoughts here. Uh, what's the best camera to have, Dave? I think probably an overhead one here. And I'll show you guys what I'm thinking. That's fine. Is there a plain piece of paper? You can just rip one out of that notebook if you would. I'm gonna show you guys another thought process that might be helpful to you. Yep, perfect. Piece of paper. So the situation I'm dealing with, and I'm gonna go ahead and break thread and move Lucy so that we can see. 
I know I said this isn't a class, but I just can't help myself showing you things. So the situation that we've got is on the edge of the quilt are half clamshells, right? And so they're going to need a partial feather quilted in them. So what I'm going to do is that halfway point is right in the middle of the clamshell. I'm going to look at a clamshell. Here's one that you guys can see a bit and see what does it look like? What does the quilting look like on that half? Now I am mirroring because I'm going to alternate my row direction. So I do have to do that mental translation, if you will. But this gives me a really clear idea of what the quilting should look like in those half shaped clamshells. Does that make sense? So that's a tool that I use often because just looking at the whole clamshell, it's just harder for my eye, for me anyways, to determine, well, how does that look like in a partial one? And I'll probably do the same thing for these little ones at the top, right? I could literally lay my paper like this and say, oh, that's what the top quilting looks like. That's what I'm gonna put in these little guys. Um, I could actually do that right now and then the top edge would be done. Why don't I? Okay, let me look at it again. And I don't know that I'll get it exact. I just know that I'll try. It will at least resemble. And that's maybe the best I can hope for. stop putting the curlicue in it just is not adding anything and it's going to fall in the binding anyways I'd love to hear what you all think of my thread choice as you're starting to see it playing out on the different fabrics I'm calling this one Iris, but you know, do you think I should have maybe gone for the neon yellow? It would really show up if I had done that. Or maybe the richer blues. Or maybe everyone thinks I made just the right choice. Who knows? But I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. So again, I'm breaking thread because I'm going to go back to the other side to start my next full row. And it needs to be from the right hand side. I think we're done with our demo piece of paper. And if you find it difficult to translate mirror image, then I would just go down to an additional row and that would be in the same direction. So, okay, this one's going left to right, right to left, left to right, right to left. If I were to quilt this row across, does that make sense? Maybe I'll do it for you. Watch this. Because then, you, then it's, you don't have to translate that mirror image. So I use that trick a lot of times. I will go and complete something that's full, that's exactly like what I want to use my piece of paper to see a partial image of. And then it's very, it's very visual at that point. You guys, Susan has made an oops. I'm trying to get too fancy here. So you guys talk to me because I've got to undo that one feather. The curve is in the wrong direction. It, it needs to echo this upper part of the clamshell. And instead I echoed the, the clamshell from the row below. So I will move the head and you guys get to watch me back up. But I hope you'll talk to me while I do it. And maybe someone would reheat my coffee cup for me too. That's a subtle hint. Did you catch that? <laughs> nope, that's fine. Dave's just changing camera angles here so you guys can see. This is definitely the unglamorous part. And you know, I don't undo quilting very often for um, small wobbles that I think will not show when you step back a few feet. 
but I do undo for things like this. I, I would not fudge that and leave one clamshell with the feathers pointing in the wrong direction. And probably each of you quilters has to find your own level of tolerance or intolerance of imperfection. But that's about where mine falls. I value consistency pretty highly, so a clamshell where the feathers run in the wrong direction, even though it's one small one at the edge, and I probably could have just started afresh in the next clamshell, and it probably would have been okay. That doesn't satisfy me. So out it comes. And just so you know, Dave went off to heat my coffee for me, so he's not even here to put your comments up on the screen. So when he gets back, he will do that. So if you have any thoughts about this, or if you want to chat with me about where your tolerance level is for fixing things, let me know. If you put it in the chat window, it'll be all set when he gets back and he'll fire those up for me. You can see my undoing method is not very scientific. It's just get her done. I put tension on the top thread, quite sharp tension on the top thread, and that enables me to pull out the bottom ones fairly easily, a stitch or two at a time. I'm quite partial to these little seam rippers. I think they're by Dritz. I don't have the lid anymore, so there's no actual name on it. And I buy them by the multiple packages, because to me, a sharp seam ripper makes a lot of difference. I mean, if you've got to rip out, that's never pleasant, but having a sharp seam ripper, especially if you're doing a seam at the sewing machine, to be able to just slide your ripper along and undo it, rather than a stitch at a time, is so wonderful, and it takes a sharp seam ripper to do that. Okay, so now we've got to decide. I'm not gonna mess about with going to the wrong row. I'm gonna get in the right row. And you guys will just have to figure out these halfway measurements when you go to do it. Okay, so I need to start with the feather at the bottom. Let me get my piece of paper. Looking at my half feather, that whole little tiny peak at the bottom has nothing in it. So there's the first one, the end of it. There's the second one. Hmm, I still don't know that I've got it quite right. But I am satisfied with it now. So that's all that really matters. And I'll tell you what, as I go along, doing row after row after row on this quilt, they will get better and better. And an argument certainly could be made for doing more doodling and practice beforehand than I might not have had that hiccup. So again, find your own personal tolerance level. I quilt better than I doodle, so I usually keep doodling to a minimum, but that's my own personal preference. paper. So the top side of the final feather in each one, I'm aiming for having it about a quarter inch from the outside of the clamshell. I see that in practice they're actually about three-eighths of an inch. I often talk in the classes that I teach about the value of intentionally thinking about your quilting as you're working and letting this type of sort of everyday quilting drive your improving your skill set and this is a great example the fourth feather that i lay against the top is very much an echo of the outside of the clamshell so i've got an opportunity across this whole quilt to practice quarter inch echoing right here if I do that stitching line with care and with thought and with intention, by the time I'm done this quilt, I will have improved my ability to echo without, you know, without marking in advance, just using my hopper foot as spacing. And I think that's a rather mir miraculous thing about the fact that you can be doing um, 
very unfussy edge to edge quilting. And I don't know that this quite qualifies as that, but just that your daily quilting can be elevating and increasing your skill set without having to do practice pieces, particularly. Okay, we have a second row in and it looks awesome. Just awesome. I'm really pleased. Here's one you can really see it on. Mr. Producer, do we have a bunch of questions that came in while you were away? Not many questions coming in apparently, so I will just keep on quilting. This one is really hard to see where I'm driving, let me tell you. That little curlicue, by the way, is just a way to travel to where I want to be set up for the next clamshell. And there's any number of things you could choose to do there. That's just one that I use a lot, and so I'm comfortable quilting it. But that is something you could easily personalize as your own little way of traveling a little bit to the next block. And as you can see, this is quite easy and quite quick, even though it looks like you know, custom quilting of feathers. But because it's just one continuous line across the quilt top, it goes pretty quickly. I recently had a workshop presentation that um, one of the topics I was addressing in it is giving examples of quilts where the piecing was an indicator you know, toward what design to choose for quilting. And I might have to add this quilt to my lineup of photos and examples. Because this is a great one. You know, this is a, a pretty quilting design on its own, but it would be difficult to do on a quilt that's, you know, a nine patch or an Irish chain or something like that, just because it's the piecing that indicates these shapes. Now let's see if we can get this half one a little better. I don't know if you saw that little lurch. That was the one of Lucy's um, rail apparatuses hitting my side clamp. So I've just added, can folks see this? No, but I'll show them. Here's a yardstick. Oh, there we go. Here's a yardstick and I'm just putting it under my strap just to lift this up a little bit. You see it now? So it lifts my red cord, which has a lot of lint on it. Oh my goodness. Um, and it lifts up my little snapper clip so that it doesn't hit here. So it doesn't take very much, right? Just lifting it up a half an inch was just enough. I paused there for a second because I just briefly thought, oh no, I've got to change directions. But of course, I am automatically changing directions at the end of the quilt, right? But the truth is I do that quite a lot when I'm quilting. Hesitate, think about where I'm going next, make it happen. In terms of the spacing for these feathers, I'm getting the hang of it better and better as I go along. But each, each clamshell is not going to be exactly like another clamshell, that is for sure. But I'm trying to assess, you know, my spacing so that my eye, because I'm not pre-marking these, but just so that my eye kind of divides up the clamshell into these four even feathers, or fairly close to even. And here comes that echo again.
that's one of the things that I love about freehand is that you get a chance to practice more than you would if you were stitching from the back of the machine with the pantograph, for example. When you're stitching at the front like this, you really are at all times practicing all these motions that then translate into custom quilting when that's what you want to do. Motions and techniques, because echoing is definitely a technique and it's definitely a learned skill. And this is a great way to practice it. Get it right this time, Susan. Get it right. <laughs> And I did that one wrong. Okay, now here's a decision, you guys. I should have been doing a bump back on that one. So the decision I'm going to make, because this is an end piece and a partial one, is I'm just going to put three feathers in it. Like that. Is it a perfect replica? It is not. Is anyone ever going to be the wiser? Nope, they sure aren't. Okay, so I'm releasing all my apparatuses. I have left Lucy with the needle down. I will just let the quilt pull the machine as I'm advancing the quilt. And I think it's looking fine. I won't advance too far so that you guys still get a good view and it doesn't get hidden behind the roller. So again, as I talked earlier about, you know, the square result being cumulative, when I advance like this, a couple of the things I do, you probably saw me pinching and pulling. I'm actually grabbing the batting underneath and tugging it too. That keeps it always smooth underneath, or you can literally flip up this floating top and make sure that that batting is smooth. And I think it looks real good. I also fairly firmly smooth this down over my front edge. It is floating down here, but I want it to be um, pulled nice and smooth. I don't want any excess fabric in there. And then lastly, I'm looking along this rail. So I don't really have a seam line, but I do have the tops of all the clamshells, right? Are they in a straight line? Is one side pulling up or dropping down? That's what I need to be aware of. And if I do that with every pass, it never gets away from me and I never get to the end and have ugly surprises. All right, we have a question or two or 10. Sun is coming out here, by the way. It's gonna be a gorgeous day today. Can't wait to get out in it. Dave, new pot of coffee on the way. Woohoo! <laughs> Betsy, everyone should have a Dave. Oh, so true, so true, but I'm not sharing, sorry. <laughs> Susan Raynars, I have to fix things. I will not rest if I leave it. And see, you know yourself, good for you my level of tolerance has shifted a little bit over the years but each person has to find their own it's really true betsy what are some of the other quilting choices that were eliminated Whoop, whew, i'm having a hard time what were some of the other quilting choices that were eliminated what did they look like um i'm trying to remember i had one that was more geometric it was almost fleur-de-lis shaped it had a, a branch out to each side and a pointy one in the middle um at this moment, I honestly can't remember, but I, there are a few of you in here who are in my current um, Knot of Masterclass students, and I have saved the plexiglass sheet, but it's not in this room, so I can't quickly go get it. And I'm going to share with my students some of those thought processes of designing and which ones were eliminated and why. It mostly boiled down to um, the choice of the quilt maker, right? I picked, I had three or four things that I thought all would work. They were all continuous line, and she liked the feathers, so... Is one way easier to quilt than the other? Meaning left to right or right to left? Um, no, I have over the years learned to quilt both directions equally comfortably. I know some people have difficulties with their machine. Moving from right to left and giving them some grief with thread breakage or shredding, more often that happens with straight lines. Most machines are quite happy quilting either direction. It's fairly important honestly to learn how to do that. It may take time, give yourself some grace, 
But, you know, for example, when you want to do a border and you'd like to do it continuously without stopping, you've got to be able to do the same thing going in all four directions, right? So that is an important skill. Addie, any recommendations on working only in a small area when stitching edge to edge designs? I think reducing my speed to help. So do you mean you're, you're doing it? you're doing a tight quilting design or are you asking how would you do this one and how would you put it in small areas? I'm not quite following what you're asking. Not only a small area. Yeah, I'm not quite following. I'm sorry. Any more? Like, are you working on a domestic machine, Addy, and you're trying to translate that a bit? Clarify for me. Hi, Susan. Do you ever use monofilament thread? Good question, Patty. I have a couple of times and my Lucy does not care for it. It gives me quite a lot of grief. I'm sure I could persevere and figure it out. I'm sure it has to do with tension or maybe what's in the bobbin. I just tend not to. I don't love the look of it. It's shiny, really shiny, and I don't love the feel of it. It's um, fishing line feeling to me. So I, I don't typically know, but that's personal preference. Is that all for questions, hon? Oh, glasses off. <laughs> Joan, where can I get Dan's guitar music? I don't, I don't think you can at this moment, Joan, but we, a few people have asked. So we've been in conversation with Dan and he's seeing what he can do. It's quite a few years since he produced um, that CD. So we're working on it. Okay, any others? Oh, there's more. Betsy again. No, same question. Is one way easier to quilt than the other? We had that one already. Kimberly, hello from Ohio. Newish subscriber, newish quilter. Right now, I just straight line quilt on my home machine. What would you say is a good next step towards long arm quilting? Oh, wow. You and Becky, same question as Kimberly. Any easy quilting pattern for beginner? Well, I think one of my favorites, and I did quilt on a domestic machine, by the way, early on. I'm just going to keep working while I talk, if that's okay with you guys. And I think I would go toward loops next because there is so much you can do with them. You can, you know, change their shape, their size, their spacing, you know, how many tendrils are between them. You can add things between them, like flowers, like stars, like cowboy boots. Um, so I think that's where I'd go, and it gives you a really good chance to practice on making smooth curves. In all cases, I feel like on a domestic machine, you often have to quilt with a smaller scale. You know, you won't be able to do the big sweeping circles and curves as easily as we can on a long arm. So yours might be just a little closer and finer. Yeah, give loops a try. Oh, I didn't even have my basting on the right hand side yet. Let me do that. And I mentioned earlier, there's as many ways to baste, I think, as there are quilters. Well, maybe not quite that many, but you know, some are really proponents of starting at the bottom, going to the top. You do what works for you. I think the reasoning behind all of them is to find a way that helps you get it flat and with no, you know, wrinkles or uh, pleats in it. So for me, my manipulation of what's already been stitched and or pulling it under the needle a little faster, that's how I deal with that problem. So I, it doesn't matter to me whether I go bottom to top or top to bottom. I just, I do it either way wherever my needle happens to be positioned. I'm gonna go ahead and put my yardstick on under this end. I do not like getting square feathers. Okay, here we go. Double check that we're starting from the right side. Yes, we are, which is the left side. <laughs> but it's the right side. I so enjoy working on other people's quilts because I get to see kinds of fabrics that are not in my own stash. But it just so happens <clears throat> that the little printed one that is in here, let's see if you can see it, the one that's right down here and right here and right here, it's an Allison Glass floral. And I am a great admirer of Allison Glass's fabrics and designs. And I happen to have that one in about 10 colorways. <laughs> so it's kind of amusing to see on this quilt. And it gives me ideas too. You have no idea how fun it is to quilt on other people's things um, just to get a chance to look at and handle different fabrics, different quilt patterns, way more than I could ever do in a lifetime. And I get to pet other people's quilts. It's awesome. I 
There's my echo again. I will say with this design, oh look, I have a fresh cup of coffee, you guys. Um, if feathers are still a stretch for you, do you want to chat for a minute, other comments, Dave? Because I want to get a couple sips in. Um, if feathers are still a stretch for you, this is, I'm so used to them and they come so comfortably to me, I'm trying to put myself in your shoes and think it through. But because I've got this mixture of the long arm, complete shape, and then a bump back, it's a little more difficult than a feather that just has the same thing repeating over and over again is all I'm saying. So if you're comfortable with feathers, this is great. It's easy. There's only four plumes. That's really fun. But you'd need to be pretty comfortable quilting both of those and being able to flip back and forth between them. But you know what? If that's not your jam, maybe you can take this design and change it up to fit where your skill level is. Maybe you can find a way to do it that does not have both types, that only has the one type. So that's the beauty of doing it freehand, is you can take this design and make it your own and do it in whatever way works for you. My throat is so dry. Okay, Addy. When I long arm, I have a tendency to stitch in a wider area and lose sight of where I've stitched. Very much that comes with practice. My method, Addy, when I'm covering a whole quilt top is usually to work, you know, in my big rectangle, I kind of work diagonally like this so that what's further away from me always has more quilting done than what's closer. Make sense? So that I don't get a corner up there that's awkward. Becky, what is that side snap system you use? It is by Red Snapper. Uh, Dave has put a link in the chat notes and I always have the link in the show notes below my YouTube episodes. Um, maybe some earlier ones I didn't, but nowadays I do. They are Red Snapper. They have a very narrow channel. They take a bit of getting used to. What I love about them best is how long they are. So try them if you like, but also if you have another brand or have access to another brand that also has that length, um, those would work equally well, I feel like. These also have a quite slim profile. So like being on the edge of my quilt here, you know, this is very shallow as opposed to being a blocky piece. Susan Bishop, love the feathers in the clamshell, still working on quilting comfortably from right to left. It is a learned skill. I mean, honestly, it's a little bit like handwriting from right to left. So you, you're kind of becoming ambidextrous in your quilting, but it's really helpful once you master it for sure. Anyway, let's get back to quilting. I would absolutely love if you would like and subscribe. Um, and if you would share this with other friends that you think might love the same type of thing. So the thumbs up that is below the episode is what I love to see. YouTube loves to see it too, and then it shares my videos with more quilters. I'm certainly struggling with getting this fourth one even, aren't I? Another fabric that's really tricky to see on.
And you certainly could quilt, quilt like this one with all the feathers going in the same direction too, if you were not quilti comfortable quilting right to left. Um, the owner of the quilt asked me if I would alternate. That was more appealing to her. But it absolutely could be done either way. Or you could pick some type of quilting design that's not so directional, that was more symmetrical within the clamshells. That would be an option too. This time I remembered that bump back shape. Whew. And in case you wondered, my studio audience has left on their drive home. When I started pulling out the applause signs, they were like, we're out of here. You know I'm kidding, right? I wonder how that would work. My mind is going a mile a minute while I'm quilting here, and I just wonder how that would work to have an actual quilting reality show with a live audience. Wouldn't that be fun? You should throw me some ideas in the comments what that might look like. And we can't do another one, so it's time to advance. Fire off your questions. It's a good time to answer them. I will advance and get a sip or two of coffee in. So again, I've just left the needle down on Lucy. And you can see me, I think you can see me, raising the rail. Uh, you can't really? So what you were seeing was my red snapper. Um, the bulge of that, if you will, was going through under the rail. So I had to lift the rail up a little bit. And I'm just lowering it down a bit again. I don't know how easy that is on your machine. On mine, it's just turning a crank. And so I raise and lower that bar frequently. I don't like my fabric to be bobbling in front of me as I'm quilting. And so I keep it... Um, fairly low, like a half inch maybe above the long arm. Um, arm. So again, I've tugged my batting underneath to make sure that it is smooth over the front. I've smoothed out my fabric and I do that fairly firmly. Like it's, so there's no excess getting pulled up in there. And I'm looking at the tops of my clamshells to make sure that they're all staying straight. And I can see there's just a tiny bit of excess here. So I'm making sure that I get this up far enough. I don't wanna smooth that down like this, right? Otherwise, my problem is going to get exacerbated in the next pass. So make sure this is straight and whatever excess is here will work in evenly. 
I should baste before I put those on. Let me just finish basting both sides and get everything set up. And then I'll stop for a few sips of coffee. I'm so parched this morning. I really should be drinking water. So we're not too, too far from being done the quilt. And then I'll, then I'll go get something more healthful than coffee. So here's another thing you guys can be thinking about. I have a couple of my own quilts here that are quite large and therefore longer time. So I'm thinking about doing one of those as a live and unscripted and not having much talking at all so that you can actually see things in real time. Like just how fast does it go to quilt a whole big project and just boom, 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 you know, advance quilt, advance quilt. What do you think of that idea? Or does it really matter to you that I do this kind of chit chat all the way through? Okay, one more side clamp and then we'll have us a chat. Okay. Is Lucy in the way? There we go. By the way, did you notice my shirt? If you think chocolate is addicting, you've obviously never tried quilting, which is funny coming to me because I'm pretty addicted to chocolate. <laughs> but quilting more so. Joan, I would rather watch, El watch Ellen you from my phone than travel to be with strangers. Oh, from my home. I'm so sorry, Joan. And not get as good of a view. Okay, makes sense. Because you certainly get the close-up views and stuff here. Um, you know, it would probably be on screens too. I'm just thinking through what that would look like. <laughs> Unless there were homemade cookies involved. Ah, but I lie on the East Coast, so I probably couldn't come anyway. Right, but what if I took it on the road? Like Dave has brainstormed this before. And it's kind of rolling around in our heads. Like, what if we had a trailer set up as a studio? And what if we took the studio on the road? Like, what would that feel like to you guys? <laughs> Something to think about. Okay, next comment. Judy, do you have a stitch length preference? Typically, when I'm doing edge to edge work like this, I do 13, which is kind of middle of the road. When I'm doing fine and intricate work, I'll make it smaller, like 15 or 16. Um, that's just my preference. Becky, what was the first long or mid-arm quilting machine you started with? It was also a Gamel. I believe it was a Classic Plus. Um, it was made in 2003, so it was fairly old and had a lot of hours on it already when I got it. Um, so this is not a lot different, except it does have the tablet added to it and the capability of doing digital designs, but the machine itself is very similar. Becky, I looked at the Red Snapper pack you're suggesting. Does the pack come with the side pulls? Okay, Mr. Producer is shaking his head. There are two separate things. So he'll probably look for a link for you. So the company that makes them is called Quilts on the Corner, which is a store, I think, in Utah. Like, it's an actual brick-and-mortar store. And she designed the red snappers and sells them and the clamps. Um, that's where I ordered mine, for sure. So if Dave can find a link, he'll put it up for you. Otherwise, look for Quilts on the Corner. All right, let's get back at it. So we are now traveling from right to left. Let's get this right. Mr. Producer says there's some great comments coming in about traveling, so we'll catch those next time. Let's get one pass done.
the lady who made this quilt. Um, some months ago, I quilted another project for her, which was a um, custom quilt and quite highly detailed. And she let me know the other day the happy news that it has been accepted into the Houston Quilt Show. So it will be there this fall. So that is quite exciting. I personally have never been to the Houston Quilt Festival. I have only ever drooled from afar. How many of you have had a chance to go? And I'll ask too, would you recommend it? And what are the things you love best about it if you've been? Is it the quilt exhibits? Is it classes and teachers? Is it vendors? Or something else entirely? Okay, we have comments though. Looks like Mr. Producer is researching stuff for you guys. He is, he, okay, I can see what he's searching for on the screen. There are no secrets here. He's looking at trailers, like with sides that open out so you can view and hang TVs. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, this, this is Dave's happy place, researching stuff. <laughs> All right. What are the questions beyond would you come see quilting in a trailer like that? So fun. <laughs> He's still hunting. He's got so many trailers loaded. Okay, Jody. Yes, traveling studio. Come to Montana. Well, I mean, Montana would be fairly easy for me, and that's a fact. We saw the red snapper one already. More? There they come. Northern Sioux. Love the idea. Can you come to Brancroft, please? Could you still do live and unscripted while traveling? Well, I would think so, yes, because we can stream from anywhere that we've got good internet. That's really the only requirement. Our equipment is fairly compact now. And yeah. Susan Raynars, the Houston Quilt Festival is amazing and huge. I've loved the classes I've taken and the exhibits are breathtaking. I mean, I can only imagine. I see pictures, obviously, um, and I can only imagine how beautiful those quilts are. Judy, the only thing I disliked about the Houston show is how tired my old legs got. I imagine you can just about measure it in the acres, right? In the miles walked, I'm sure. Yeah. Okay. One more sip. You guys, I'm so parched today. I don't know why. So I'm sorry I keep gulping on the mic, but I have to wet my whistle some way. All right. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, we're about halfway. If I talked less, we'd get done faster. I don't know that you're able to see it on camera, but twice now in this row, I've had a little wobble where the machine does not quite respond like it should. So as soon as I'm done this pass, again, this being a reality show, I'm gonna get me a couple alcohol swabs and walk around and clean my rails a bit. There must be a little bit of lint or a piece of thread or something hanging around in my rails and I can just a little bit feel that resistance.
Okay, we're going to pause right there. And Mr. Producer knows this job because he often does it for me when I'm working. I just have little medical variety alcohol swabs. You certainly could do it with a scrap of batting and a little rubbing alcohol. But uh, I happen to have these, so that's what I'm using. And I'm just going to clean my wheels a little bit. And I'm actually going to make my needle go up so that I can roll two or three inches. So I've got wheels, right, that are turning on my racks. I'm not sure what part of me you're seeing, but hopefully you can still hear my voice and not see things you'd rather not be looking at. Um, so I'm just running my alcohol swab and moving Lucy back and forth a little bit so that I get the full circumference of the wheels. And then I'll go back to all the four sort of corners and wipe along the rail. Just shifting Lucy enough that I can get um, all the areas of the rail. And I know I didn't break thread and I could have. There's going to be a tail over there, but that's all right. And I clean this in all sorts of ways. Often when I'm vacuuming my studio, I'll run a thin little um, attachment along here to pick up threads and fuzz. But the alcohol swab really picks up even the blackness left from the wheels and things like that. So we'll see if that improves things a little bit. Okay. We have a question about what? Sorry. I, okay. Um, yes, one of you is asking about... No, it's not on the screen, dear. I've got something else on the screen. There we go. Is that a solo cup? Yes, it is. Lucy happens to have a peg. I don't know that you can see it, but it's about a half inch peg right there. I'm sure it's for adjusting something. I don't happen to know what it is, but I just cut a little hole, that one, in the bottom of my cup, and I just insert it on there, and it's my thread receptacle, like thread snips, and I also throw my markers and my seam ripper in there, and then they're always handy. It's not high tech, but it does work. Debbie, do you know what the backing fabric is, as in what line or who it's made by? I don't. There is no selvage on it. Now, I can ask the quilt maker if you'd like and try and find out for you. Um, look at this. Mr. Producer has pulled it up. <laughs> he'll, see, oh, he'll let you know in the comments who the designer is, where you might be able to find it. I do know Lori, the maker, said that these fabrics came from her stash, so I do not know that it is current necessarily. Okay, you guys, now we've got a tail. Seriously, I get talking and then I forget, you know, where I was at. So let's trim off the tails a little bit. I do like having my frequently used tools close by. My little scissors hangs on a small magnet too so that it's within easy reach.
and we're at a bobbin thread. Okay, here's my bobbin story, and I tell this one often. Um, many machines have an onboard bobbin loading system and or an onboard um, notification of when your bobbin is running out, and usually that's based on you setting up how many revolutions there are for the bobbin, which of course changes with every type of thread, etc., etc. So my personal preference is just let the thing run out and then change the bobbin. So that's what you're seeing here. I'm undoing a couple of inches because those last few inches won't have had good tension on them, right, as it was running out in the bobbin end, and also because it's much less noticeable to do a splice in a corner, in a point. So I'm just going to go back to the point of this feather and grab my fresh bobbin, and we'll be up and away. And the advantage of doing it in the points of these feathers is that um, it'll be easy to lock stitch right over it so those ends won't come loose at any point. So I'm just going to go ahead and cut those two threads right next to the fabric. I drop my seam ripper there so I can find it easily when I come back. And I will grab another bobbin. And often at this point I set another one up to start loading so that it's ready for me. But in this case, I know one more is going to be enough. So I did not. So I've just pulled up my bottom thread. Did you see that? I just took one stitch and pulled it up. I'm right overlapping. I'm actually stitching over the last few stitches of the last feather. And I'm doing four or five really close stitches together and then just launching right back into my design. and no one will be any the wiser. I can't quite do it in one more pass, so I'll just advance enough to do maybe two rows and then there'll be one more pass after that. Yeah, I can't get it all in one. So again, Tugging everything smooth and taut. This is the end of the quilt. I just want enough hanging over the end that I, my magnets will still hold things in place. I don't like to end, you know, with it up here because then I can neither reach it to baste it nor reach it to magnet it. Okay, we have a couple questions. <clears throat> and which camera am I on? This one. <laughs> well, I have to read up here though. Aren't we funny? We go back and forth. There we are. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Patty. I've never tried another long arm than the one I have. It is an HQ Avante with a throat space of 18 inches. I'm five foot four. Would a bigger throat space be more enjoyable and productive for me? Might depend on your arm length, Patty. Like, I cannot easily quilt to full length of this one, and I'm about five four too. Um, as you can see, I keep my rails quite high, so the height will affect how far you can reach as well. But if you want to try it out, I would go into a dealership or to a quilt show and ask them. And in fact, for me, before I bought this machine, um, I went to a dealership where I slightly knew the owners of it. And I actually rented time from them and did a whole quilt on one of their long arms that I was considering. Because that will really give you a feel for it, right? Just quilting a little sample patch might not. So I think arm length might depend more than height. Because you can raise and lower this part of the quilt. Hope that helps. Oh, there's more. I'm so sorry. Judy, I've seen videos where the rails get waxed, but I'm leery of doing that. Do you wax yours? I've never seen that, actually. I wonder what the purpose would be. Do you know? Anyway, I, I don't wax mine. I've never heard of that. I'm curious now. Lori, I'd love to see you do your own large quilt all the way through. Okay, good. Good to know. Debbie, if you go to the Houston Quilt Show, take lots of money. Lots. Good tip. I'll remember that. I cannot read the poll. Nope. Okay, so the poll question, which you guys will know, was um, would you watch a large quilt if it was just streaming and not not chatting? You just saw the quilting. And 71% have said yes, so that's good. 
Oh, now Mr. Producer was saying only seven people voted. So we need a few more people to vote on that. So the question again was, if I were to do a large quilt of my own, uh, I think they're about 95 square. I have two of them. Um, for the sake of time, I would like just load it and quilt without talking and chattering so that you could really see things at the speed at which I usually work in my studio. Would that be interesting to you? Or would that be like watching grass grow? Let me know. So here is where... If you remember, I had just a little excess going on on this side. And again, I'm just putting my attention on the portion that's already been stitched. And it doesn't even take very much. It just pulls the unstitched portion under the neater, needle a shade faster. And that's enough to take up that little bit of loose fabric that I had. I think it's important to remember always that we are working with fabric and that it does have movement and stretch and give. And so it, it behooves us to pay attention and get the best result we can. It's not the fault of the piecer. You know, I, I don't think I've ever met a quilt that is perfectly, perfectly square. So I just like to add my layer of helping to get that square result. And that's pretty easy to do with your basting. Okay, I have something going on over there, Dave. There's resistance, definitely. Okay, you guys, we're troubleshooting a little bit. I don't know what it is. I'm just feeling when I move Lucy, she's not moving as freely as she ought to. Hang on a second. I'm going around to see from the other side. It's not any cables. I didn't leave an alcohol swab laying. Okay, I figured it out. This is how it goes, you guys. Okay, which camera are we on? Probably a big one. Yeah, that'll be a good one. I figured out what it is. So I can feel Lucy's not moving quite as freely as she ought. So I'm looking, are there things sitting on the rails? You know, if I run over a cable, whatever. And what it is, is my red snapper bar is right down so that my quilt is pressing onto this bar right here and giving me more resistance than I should have. So the answer to that, of course, is crank it up a few notches. Now let's feel. Ah, much better. And that will happen too if you're doing a large quilt. As your roll gets fluffier and thicker, you will have to adjust for that too. which side we're stitching from the left have you guys watched princess bride the old fella that says walk oh wrong movie sorry yep wrong movie well now i have to finish the story the movie is lady hawk there's an old fella in a monastery and he's hollering down to the people that he's kind of rescuing walk on the left side so that's kind of a family joke. Every time we do anything on the left, that's what comes to mind. I'm curious if many of you are thinking about or preparing for quilt shows in your own local areas. Certainly this year there's quite a lot of them happening around me. I'm quite looking forward to them. I went to one last weekend in northern Idaho. 
The one that is local to me here in Spokane happens in October. Um, there's a tiny, tiny, tiny little town just south of Spokane that's doing a kind of mini Sisters Oregon show. Let's call it the Little Sister, right? Anyway, um, on similar lines, they're doing an outdoor show just for the one day. And that's happening in July, and they have invited me to be the featured quilter. So I'm in the process of choosing what projects I want to take and show and kind of what topics I'm going to talk about. So I am really looking forward to that. If any of you who are semi-local would be interested in attending, it is in Rosalia. And you can find information online. They have a Facebook page and so forth. That gives information about it. Alrighty, one more advance. It'll be your last opportunity to ask a few questions. Don't forget, check out my podcast, Measure Twice, Cut Once. It is, at least so far, interview-based. So each episode is an interview with another quilter or occasionally another crafter hearing their story. Um, let's see, who are some of the people coming up? Beth Ann Nemesh is one. Leisha Farnsworth is another. Recently, Sue Hines was a guest. Joan, who's been talking here this morning, Joan Porter, she has been a guest. Joan Porter, A Quilter's Memoir, if you want to have a listen to that one. I'm going to drop a couple pins in here just to keep it straight. Uh, Carly Porter just released this last Wednesday, so that one's up. So some fun listening. Each one is a little bit different from the other. Um, yeah. And don't forget, please, to like and subscribe. And by like, I mean the little thumbs up that is below this video. That really helps me to get found by some other quilters. And feel free to share as well. I so appreciate that. And if you're interested in supporting us in what we do, you can do that at buymeacoffee.com forward slash stitched by Susan. Did I say Porter, Joan? I'm so sorry. Joan Parker. I know it. Joan and I have done a lot of visiting over the interwebs, although we've never met in person. I apologize. 
But then I get asked from time to time how to spell my last name, which is Smith. So clearly more than one of us has problems with names. <laughs> but thanks for correcting me, Joan, because I would want to keep that right. So once again, I'm making use of my horizontal channel lock for this bottom edge so that I'm sure to get it straight. And I pinned it, kind of eyeballing it, and now I'm making my new adjustments as I go. Because I know my machine is stitching in a straight line, I can adjust my quilt just a little bit to accommodate it. And I do often stitch over my pins, it's heresy I know, but when I'm going slowly along this basted edge, I frequently do stitch over my pins just like that. And it seems to work out fine. So again, can you see how I'm putting just a little tension on this side, even though this quilt is very flat? Because your hopper foot is pushing just a little bit with every stitch, if you don't do anything, it does tend to push out in front of you. So just that little bit of tension behind the stitching pulls it under the needle a hair faster. And just like that, you've got a nice flat seam. It's really simple, but really effective. And here too, my thumb is now putting pressure on the front. Again, the part that's already been stitched. This is where, as I mentioned earlier, there are lots of quilters that would say, you've got to stitch from the top down. Equally, there are quilters that say, you've got to stitch from the bottom up. The goal is the same, getting it flat and without puckers or pleats. So whatever way you can achieve that, for me, it means putting that bit of pressure on the fabric that's already stitched. For you, you might figure out a different way. Be my guest. This is where these little grippers become a bit of a challenge. I've got the seam allowance now in my in my edging over here, and there's a really, really narrow channel that you have to fit that fabric into. And I will show you my little trick for that on the other side. It works pretty slick. Should have shown on that side where you could see. Well, I apologize for that. But my trick is basically a corsage pin, and I just use it to smooth the fabric right in there. But actually, I'm looking at this side, and it's not exactly even. I don't even know that I can put this one. Oh, maybe I can. I think I can. There was a little notch where the seam is, but there's enough of clearance. There's about a half an inch of depth in that channel, maybe even closer to an inch. And so I've just been able to push it in there and it's gripping all the way along. I'm happy. Real happy. My coffee cup's at this end, so I'm happy too. Getting a sip in. I hope that gulp does not sound too terrible on camera or on mic. We just have a few left. Let me just tuck my yardstick in here and be on the safe side. I have never sewn a clamshell quilt like this myself, but I tell you what, I'm all admiration of this one because it's all curves, right? You saw that when I showed you the back of it. And honestly, it lays amazingly flat and smooth. I'm so impressed.
as you maybe saw on that one, my spacing was not top notch. I ended up with a fourth very slim feather. But I just proceed. I aim for consistency. I do not aim for perfection, so I don't have to worry when I don't hit it spot on every time. Overall, I think the spacing and the size of the feathers is pretty consistent across the quilt top. So I think that's chiefly what your eye will see when it's all said and done. You may have noticed that I did not um, use constant mode stitching or unregulated stitching at all in this quilt. And I often do because I do love it for many things and in many situations. But on this quilt, there's quite a lot of slowing down, right? To, to either think of where I'm going next or to get myself organized for spacing um, the feathers or even just the fact that I'm ending in a point so frequently and not just quilting long, continuous lines. For all those reasons, I thought today was an appropriate day to just keep that regulator on. And also, I do have the added complexity, and it is one, of talking while I'm stitching, right? So it's just another thing to be thinking about. If I was quietly by myself, I might still do this without that regulator on and just, just go for it. It certainly can be done, so if you don't have a stitch regulator, don't let that stop you.
And here we are at the bottom. And I'm going to get my trusty paper again. Because this time we've got, where can we see easily, Dave? Maybe on the overhead one? That'll work. This time we've got half moon shapes, right? The whole bottom part is gone. So if I cover that up, that gives me a pretty good sense of what it should look like. Um, we'll just see how well I translate that in my head. Let me look at one that's going in the right direction, like this one. And maybe, uh, going to the right, is there a good one that I can leave my paper on? Not really. I'll do it on that one and I'll start on the other side of the quilt. Because then I can just look up and literally use this for reference for where to lay in my feathers along these half moons. So it just looks like the quilting continued right off the quilt. I just wonder, one, two, three, four. I'm just thinking my quilting path through. Forgive me while I do this. <clears throat> yep, that's what I was afraid of. I don't, I don't have a way to do the bump back, so I end up being in the wrong location. So we might have to make a little adjustment on this. If I do this arc. <laughs> and this one goes all the way over, and this one goes all the way back, and this one is my final bump, and that's the only feather that you actually see the curve of. That works. Okay. Did you see what I just did? You know, I'm going to leave it because I can make a beautiful little swirl out of it. Lori, if you're watching, that is the, um, the small imperfect part on your quilt. <laughs> and I might send you a picture of it afterwards and ask you if you want me to change it out because I certainly could. But sometimes it's fun to have that little story piece in there. Can you find the funny curlicue? It can be really challenging to do <clears throat> partial motifs like this. And I suppose another solution honestly would be just to stitch the entire feather and have it run off the end. I don't love that because I worry a little bit about some of that stitching coming undone then but you could maybe shorten up your stitch length or you could um, stitch across your basting lines several times to really anchor things. Like there's other ways you could do this if you're not comfortable winging this sort of partial design. Okay, that's it folks. That is the end of our quilt. So I'd love to take some more comments if you have them. Take my paper off. Grab my cuppa. Okay, glasses off. Lynn, I missed out on registration for the master class. When will the next one start? Um, why don't you email me on that one, Lynn, and we'll see what we can do because I'm not planning on running it again till into the winter. So email me if you would, info at stitchedbysusan.com and let's have a conversation, okay? Patty, I'm so glad I found your channel. I always hated doing pantographs because I felt like it was too hard to stay right on the path and look good enough. I'm anxious to try doing it freehand now. Let you in on a secret, Patty. I've never done a pantograph on a whole quilt. The whole idea of quilting from the, from the back of the machine and not being able to see what my needle was doing, to me, is not intuitive. Um, 
I way, way, way prefer to quilt from the front because I feel like I can make more graceful shapes. Like I, I can't even fathom trying to do something like this from the back of the machine. So I love quilting from the front. It's really freeing, I think. Cindy, thanks you, thank you both for your show. I finished the most complicated piece with applique diamonds to form stars quilt. And when I used tons of your lesson ideas, it came off the long arm beautiful and square. Oh, I'm so happy to hear that, Cindy. And I'd love if you would send me a picture or like share on Facebook or Instagram and tag me. I would love to see what you did. And I'm glad my tips helped. Cindy, again, I love the way the feathers made each clamshell pop. Gorgeous as always. I'm really curious to see how it looks on the back. I mean, it's a really busy print. It's not going to show up super well, but I'm curious if this looks like clamshells from the back too, and I think that it will. Lori, this is who the quilt belongs to. The quilt shop that I bought the backing from is Calico Creations in Mount Vernon, Washington. I'm thankful to Susan and David for making my quilts come alive. We have a lot of fun with them, Lori. Thanks for entrusting me with them. Lori, I love, I have to tell you that I love the magnet system that you recommended. It helps secure the fourth side. I don't know how I lived without them. I completely agree, Lori. I don't know how one would get square quilts without them either. Because as you quilt, this wants to pull up. Of course it does, if you don't have something holding it in place. Shannon, I find myself moving my hands, arms, mim mimicking your movement. Seems to help my muscle memory. Fantastic. Fantastic. I'm sure that it does help the muscle memory. Paula, just switched from watching you on my phone to a big screen TV. <laughs> oh, yay. I can see everything so much better, including all the gray hairs, I'm sure. But that's okay. I'm embracing them. <laughs> but I'm glad, Paula. I bet it is a lot easier to see on a bigger screen. Okay, did we get any conclusive polling answers on whether to do a, long, um, a longer quilt, but a less talking sort of production? Okay, so our poll ended with 21 people voting, which is not a bunch of you. And honestly, you can chime in in the comments after this episode is um, when we're not live anymore. But most people are voting for doing a long one and just literally doing it in real time, not stopping to talk and chatter and point out things as I always do. So I will put that in the back of my mind and seriously think about doing that. So that episode then would just be a quilt and I would just come in and start it, introduce it, and then just quilt. So yeah, like and subscribe. The little thumbs up below the video is so helpful for me to get seen by other quilters. Feel free to share this episode. You can share the link very, very easily. There's a little airplane kind of arrow that lets you um, share with any friends. I would love that. Don't forget to have a listen to the podcast. I would so appreciate that. And if any of you do want more information on my masterclass, which is a huge online course, pre-recorded, self-paced, all those things, um, you can find information on my website, stitchedbysusan.com. There's a free hand masterclass tab in the menu, and that will take you to the informational page. There's lots of details about it, what's in the modules, the price tag, all the things are in there. And of course, you can always email me with questions, info at stitchedbysusan.com. So just to recap, these live and unscripted episodes are aired the first and third Friday of each month. June happens to have five Fridays, and often on that fifth Friday, I do a little bonus something something. It's not going to happen in June because there's so much on my calendar. So I will be back first Saturday in June, or in July, I'm sorry, with another project, live and unscripted. And I look forward to seeing you all then. Thanks so very much for joining me, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. <music>